Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening here in the U.S. Um, PASE members and colleagues, I would like to welcome you to the highlight of the meeting, the awarding of the Severino and PASE Co-Lectureship Award. Professor, uh, because this is our 40th anniversary, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Professor Ko. Professor Ko was one of the original co-founder of PASE. He completed his PhD thesis at Purdue University uh, with the title on the foundations of nonlinear thermal viscoelasticity. He moved to the University of Maryland where he founded the College of Engineering and served as associate dean in 1964. Professor and Ms. Coe and early founders of PASE left a lasting legacy in the form of a generous endowment that provides a cash award to the winner. In 2000, at the Manila Shangri-La Hotel, this award was first established to recognize a PASE member with outstanding scientific and technological accomplishments. It was originally called the Founders Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering. And the name was changed to the Severino and Pasco Lectureship Awards in Science and Engineering upon Professor Coe's death in 2004. And this year's awardee is Dr. Just Santos. Pase President Concepcion will read the certificate and Dr. Uh, Colaba will present the check for 1,000 US dollars. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Gisela Concepcion. I am deeply honored to present this certificate of award to Dr. Just R. Santos, the 2020 Severino and Pasco Lectureship Awardee in Engineering. Given this day, 22 July 2020, during the 40th Pass Anniversary and 2020 APAMS, Manila, Philippines. Signed, Gisela P. Concepcion, PASA President 2020, Alvin Culaba, Chair, PASA Committee on Severina and PASCO Lectureship Awards 2020, attested by Lourdes Herald, PASA Secretary 2020. Congratulations, Dr. Juice Santos. Uh, thank you so much, Giselle. And the check of US dollar 1,000 juice, please, uh, the honors of receiving. Thank you. Thank you for sending me the checks and certificates. The Severino and Paz Co Lectureship Award in Engineering, Dr. Juice Santos. We know him as Juice, currently an associate professor at the Department of Engineering Management and Systems Engineering, George Washington University. His research interests lie at the intersection of systems engineering, disaster risk analysis, and economics. Professor Santos is one of the principal investigators in the 2018 Mitigation Saves, a highly cited report internationally. He's also one of the PIs in a multi-university National Science Foundation grant titled Organizing Decentralized Resilience in Critical Interdependent Infrastructure Systems and Processes. One of the key developers of the Inoperability Input-Output Model or IIM which utilizes and transforms economic input-output accounts for disaster risk analysis applications. This model has been applied to hurricane impact analysis, multi-state electric power blackout, evaluation of renewable energy options, and most recently, in the analysis of mitigation measures in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. A two-time DOSD Balik scientist in 2012 and 2016, 
and as a visiting professor in 2015 in the Philippines. He had mentored Filipino graduate students, notably Dr. Joanna Resurrection and Dr. Krista Yu of UP Diliman and DLSU, respectively. The results of his research activities are documented in more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, including a highly cited article on the use of IIM, which appeared in an issue of Risk Analysis Journal in 2004, and subsequently earned him two Best Paper Awards from the Society for Risk Analysis. In 2009, he received the prestigious Leontief Memorial Prize from the International Input-Output Association. Juice grew up and spent his childhood and adolescent years in a low-income rural area in the Philippines. His mother was an elementary school teacher and single-handedly took care of him and his two siblings with her measly salary. His educational journey was centered on his vision to become a teacher, just like his mother. A scholar all throughout, his teaching career began at UP as an instructor in engineering sciences in 1994. He was an outstanding instructor awardee from the UP College of Engineering in 1996. In 1999, he pursued his PhD degree in systems engineering at the University of Virginia, where he received the Louis T. Rader Outstanding Graduate Student Award. He dedicates this co-lectureship award to his mother and first teacher, Emiliana Santos, who has inspired him to enter and pursue the indescribably beautiful world of teaching. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Alvin Kulaba. I promise that I will turn on my video once uh, the presentation is over. So just uh, to make sure, before I begin, uh, can everyone uh, see the slide that I have just uh, shared on the screen? Yes, Juice. Uh, thank yeah, you so much. Uh, thank you so much. So um, again, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kulaba. Good morning and good evening to my Kababayans in the Philippines in the USA, and in other parts of the globe. I am most definitely honored to have been nominated and selected for this year's 2020 Severino and PASCO Award Lectureship in Engineering. So the title of my presentation is Systems Engineering Perspectives on Disaster Risk Management. I would certainly be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the following. First and foremost, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, especially the nominator, and the committee who eventually conferred me the co-award for engineering. Secondly, the National Science Foundation for funding my current and, and past grants and for supporting my interest with disasters, disaster risk management, that is. And finally, for the George Washington University, which I have considered my second home since 2009. On a personal level, I dedicate this presentation to my friends way back from my student days at the University of Philippines, Diliman. After all these years, our friendship has not dissipated. We still meet regularly via Zoom, and I ac actually can see some of them here attending uh, this Zoom presentation. And secondly, to my friends whom I have met via the karaoke app, Smule, <laughs> thank you for helping me maintain a mostly happy life while in isolation through your gift of music. Let's keep on singing, jamming, and dancing till the wee hours of the morning and be always deserving of the hashtag Locarets. To my research collaborators from De La Salle University, whom I truly consider friends, Thank you for letting me immerse in productive research while enjoying your world-class friendship. Also, among these pictures are two of my PhD students whom I mentored at the George Washington University, who are now serving the nation Philippines through educating the future generation, one at UP Diliman and the other at De La Salle University, Manila. And finally, this is not a Photoshop picture. It really did happen. 
at the beginning of the year 2020, my family and I, we were together in 100 Islands in Alaminos, Pangasinan. And it was indeed a 100% quality family bonding moment. I'm so glad we did it before the pandemic became more complicated. So uh, this slide shows the outline of my talk. Many of you here know and have probably read some of my papers on input-output models. Input-output modeling has its roots from the field of economics, and its application in engineering has been one of the things that I started together with my PhD advisor way back in the early 2000s. To date, a Google search of inoperability input-output model collectively would reveal upwards of 20,000 hits. The inoperability input-output model, or IIM in short, has been featured in a myriad of disaster risk management applications. Hence, it has been tremendously challenging for me to choose the two applications that I'd like to showcase in this presentation. In the end, I decided to choose the following two studies. Firstly, the mitigation save study, and secondly, the recently published papers on the COVID-19 pandemic. This presentation will then culminate with a Q&A portion. The next slide will present a quick overview of this presentation. With the rising likelihood and consequences from natural and human caused disasters, it is constructed to decompose the two primary types of loss associated with such events. The first is the so-called stock loss, which would include damage to human and man-made natural physical systems. The second is the so-called flow loss, which the literature also refers to business interruptions or BI in short. I know that Filipinos use BI for something else, but for this presentation, it stands for business interruptions. Business interruption, according to leading academic and insurance journals, has ranked among the costliest category of financial loss and also highest area of risk concern amongst economic sectors. In this series of slides, I will present a relatively quick lecture on input-output models and its uh, inoperability input-output model extensions. The Leontief IEO model or input-output model has been developed by Wassily Leontief in the 1930s, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1973. Anyone who would like to know more and explore about the model should have a copy of the so-called Bible for Input-Output <laughs> Analysis, which is the book by Miller and Blair, as shown at the bottom of the slide. This simplified generic two-sector economy has been lifted directly from Miller and Blair's book. The highlighted cells here show the inter-industry inter transactions or the endogenous consumptions from within the sectors themselves. Shown also is the column of final demands, which are the exogenous or external consumptions attributable to the households, government, and private firms. It also includes imports and exports. Note that the sum of the final demands give rise to the so-called gross domestic product or GDP, which I assume everyone is familiar with. This table also shows the value added row. Examples of value added include compensation to employees, machines, hardware, software, and others. Coincidentally, the sum of the value added also gives the gross domestic product, which uh, is actually a really beautiful mathematical thing that's going on here in, in the input-output table. When the shaded cells are normalized, it produces the so-called Leontief matrix A, which measures the strength of interdependencies across the sectors. In this slide, uh, furthermore, when we subtract the matrix A from the previous slide, we subtract it from a conformable identity matrix I, and eventually take its inverse, this would generate the total requirements matrix denoted by L. When I was still a young instructor at the University of the Philippines, I used to teach linear algebra and never in my wildest dream to see a real world application of matrix inversion 
happening right before my and your eyes. So many nations across the globe, including the Philippines, publish the, the L matrix. Important policy insights can be gleaned from its column sums. For example, if you look at the value of 1.51, which is the column sum for column one, how do we interpret it? It means that for every $1 or one peso increase in the demand for sector one, the resulting increase in the production will be $1.51. The first column of L matrix shows how such total production increase is distributed across the two sectors, $1.25 for sector one and 0.26 cents for sector two. The same can be said for the second column sum, which is 1.45, which is the total output multiplier for sector two. Shown here is an actual L matrix for the United States, comprising of 15 sectors. Note that higher resolution L matrices can comprise of more than 400 sectors. To explain the column sums, this 15 sector aggregation shall suffice. Note that the sector here, look at the highlighted cells here in red. The sector with the highest column sum is the manufacturing sector, which is S5. Its total multiplier is 2.48, which is quite high, knowing that we are talking about magnitudes of billions of dollars. It is followed by agriculture, denoted by S1, with a multiplier of 2.25. This is the reason why when stimulating the GDP for any economy, policymakers typically look, look for such key sectors, which in layman's terms, give the biggest bang for the buck. More advanced key sector analysis uses the concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we will not cover in this lecture due to time constraints. This slide shows the IIM, which is a transformation of the IEO model. Several key points need to be emphasized here. First, instead of the monetary units, we normalize the output in dollars using the inoperability metric. It is a variable between zero and one, which measures the proportion in which the sector is unable to satisfy its as-planned output. For example, a value of zero for inoperability is the ideal level, meaning to say the sector is flawlessly operating. And a value of one, another extreme value, it can be interpreted in such a way that the sector is completely out of commission or completely inoperable. The model also includes the resilience matrix, which represents the rate with which a sector is expected to bounce back to the pre-disaster level of production. The model also includes the impact on demand denoted by C. And finally, it has to be noted that this is a dynamic model that gives the level of inoperability in each time step of the recovery horizon. This slide demonstrates a two-sector stylized example that shows how a directly impacted sector, which in this case is sector two, the light blue curve. Uh, when uh, sector two, when we uh, take a look at it, it starts with a high level of inoperability until it recovers to a near zero in operability. This slide also shows another sector, which I'd like to uh, show, uh, to uh, request your attention to look at the dark blue curve here, which is sector one. This sector, sector one, which, which it wasn't uh, directly perturbed, but it became increasingly inoperable until it reaches its peak and then starts recovering. This graphic shows how the input-output model, depending on the intensity of the impact on the sectors, which is the yellow, orange, and green shaded cells there, depending on the intensity of the impact on the sectors would create cascading impact on other sectors of the economy. In the United States, input-output data can be accessed through the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is a division under the census um, bureau, and also a private company called Implan. 
In the Philippines, I believe it's uh, the acronym is NCSB, the Na or NSCB, uh, National Statistical Coordination Board. So in this slide, I took the liberty of uh, sharing with you a screenshot of what you would expect when you go to the Bureau of Economic Analysis input-output accounts. Input-output data are publicly available through this website for free. This screenshot shows various resolutions of the model according to 1571 or 405 industry sector classifications. Having introduced the input-output theory and data sources, we now delve into the first of the two applications that I prepared for tonight's presentation. The first one is the mitigation save study. The mitigation save study was funded by the National Institute for Building Sciences, and we worked actively with agencies like FEMA, Housing and Urban Development, and others. The second version of mitigation saves, which uh, we uh, use the mnemonic MSB2, for which I was one of the investigators, produced an average benefit to cost ratio of six to one. The details for the different kinds of disaster are also shown in the table here uh, on the right panel of this slide. This was a rigorous study in which multiple academic and research institutions were involved. One of my favorite quotes from Benjamin, ben Benjamin Franklin, he once said that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And analogously, indeed in this study, we have proven that a dollar worth of mitigation investment translates to an average savings of about $6 relative to the unmitigated case. You might think that $6 is uh, small, but when we talk about billions of dollars of investments, this translates to $6 billion, um, dollars, which I believe is the check that Paasa is going to issue to me. <laughs> The mitigation save study has been cited by a myriad of news articles, academic journals, and government agencies. The study was cited in the U.S. Congress Flood Risk Mitigation Act of 2018, as shown in this slide. So we are, the, we are shown as footnote number four here. So what did I do for this uh, mitigation save study? The methodology that I developed comprises of the two following phases. First, we looked at various building types and we mapped them according to the most relevant input-output sectors with which they belong. This process will be explained on subsequent slides. And secondly, we simulated various resilience strategies to decrease the impact of a disaster. We simulated various types of building damage superimposed the resilience strategies and computed the resulting direct and indirect business interruptions. In the next few slides, I will take you to a quick journey of how we develop the methodology and uh, present you the key or the highlights of the results. This table shows the mapping between the input-output sectors and the building types. Once the damage was assessed in each building type, we ran the input-output model to estimate the business interruption losses, taking into consideration the implementation of resilience strategies. As you can see here, examples of building categories could range from residential, commercial, industrial, and as well as education and government. And uh, here, we, you could see the mapping of uh, the input-output sector categories and the different building types. There are 33 building types that we used according to the software called Hazus that I showed you from the previous slide. So you can see a one-to-one, -one, um, almost a seemingly one-to-one -one direct correspondence between the equivalent input-output sector and also the Hazus building occupancy class. Next, four types of resilience strategies were considered, namely production recapture, examples of 
production recapture include overtime and extra shifts to catch up for lost production. Secondly, inventory. This includes stockpiles of production inputs to anticipate supply shortfalls. And then we also have relocation, which is moving production to other regions that are not impacted by a disaster. And finally, excess capacity, which refers to underutilized factories or equipment that can be invoked in times of disasters. For those attendees who are located in the DMV, DC, Maryland, uh, Virginia area, there's a storm brewing right now. So I'm gonna cross my fingers that um, I won't get disconnected. This actually makes me feel nostalgic. I'm go going out of my script. When I presented my final um, project uh, for the Balik Science, science um, Scientist Program, and I know that uh, Raymond Tan is in the audience. There was a uh, like severe weather disturbance. His car got flooded. And every time I would make this presentation, it's so, it, it seems that disasters uh, like to be um, keeping me company during these kinds of presentations. So um, we're halfway there. So I'm sure I'll be able to go under the 40 minute allocation that was uh, given to me by Dr. Kulaba. This set of graphics published by a collaborator and former student, uh, Cash Barker, shows the efficacy of inventories in delaying, delaying the impact of disasters on various sectors. Without inventory, shown in red, the, the inoperability is expected to be significantly higher, especially at the beginning phases of a disaster. The blue curves show how inoperability and ultimately business interruptions can be significantly reduced by having stockpiles of inventories in anticipation of the arrival of a disaster. Shown in this plot is the concept of production recapture in the context of the so-called resilience triangle. The black curve shows the baseline inoperability trajectory while the red curve shows the corresponding reduced level of inoperability due to production recapture. Again, production recapture includes overtime and extra shifts to recoup for lost uh, production. This table shows the recapture rate for various sectors of the economy. A quick example, I'd like to point your attention to the first value you can see in this table, uh, 0.75. The first value of 0.75 means that the agriculture sector is expected to recover 75% of its lost production for the first three months or first 90 days. The same interpretation can be said about the other values of the table shown in this slide. So some sectors are leveraging production recapture much better than others. As you can see, you can uh, see 0.98 and some sectors, like at the bottom here, government sector is not typically good with production recapture. The production recapture is only 47%. The discussion of the remaining resilience strategies, I've mentioned relocation and excess capacity, has been truncated in tonight's presentation in the interest of time. Now, let us proceed with the key results. This chart shows the business interruption loss for every $1 loss in each of the 33 building types. This chart assumes that resilience strategies are in place. Entertainment and resident, residential sectors are among the sectors that have high business interruption multipliers. And this result is quite intuitive. For example, it is difficult to recoup lost shows movies or concerts for the entertainment sector. The concept of production recapture or inventory do not particularly apply to the entertainment sector. The same can be said for residential sectors, which include hotels and other temporary dwellings. This slide juxtaposes the result with the omission of the resilience strategies. Without resilience, shown in red, red bars, the picture drastically changes. 
The high business interruption multipliers would now include sectors such as food, drugs, agriculture, banks, professional services, and education. I, for one, can serve as a testament as a professor that I've already taught seemingly gazillions of online courses for the past uh, few weeks. And uh, that shows the resilience of uh, universities, just like the university that I am currently with, the George Washington University. So in summary, for the mitigation save study, we developed a methodology for linking building types with economic sectors, simulated direct damage scenarios, applied resilience tactics, and assessed business interruption multipliers for various building types. Such multipliers were integrated with other benefits of mitigation from different dimensions, including savings associated with adherence with building codes. So one of my best friends, she's now the same age as myself, retired, happily retired in Florida. And Florida is one of the states that adhere to the, strictly to the so-called I codes or international building codes. And she mentioned to me that if you buy a property that doesn't comply with the building codes, you will have to pay hefty insurance premiums. So um, also uh, uh, for business interruption, um, one of our collaborators also calculated the cost of loss of lives and also the incidence of the post-traumatic stress disorder. So we now, move on to another case study, the second and final case study that I'll be presenting to you today or tonight uh, for people in the United States. In the next uh, set of slides, we will make a gear shift and proceed with the application of the inoperability input out output model to the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent weeks, I have published COVID-19 related papers in two journals. The left of the slide shows the front page of the paper published in Environment Systems and Decisions. The right panel of the slide shows uh, the one that is published in Sustainable Production and Consumption, or SPC. A special shout out to Professor Raymond Tan for connecting me with the editor-in-chief of SPC and providing ideas on how to frame the paper. To set the context for the case study, let us look at the flatten the curve concept as depicted in this slide. Flattening the curve is of extreme importance since it relieves the pressure of the constrained capacity of healthcare systems, essentially buying time before effective vaccines become available. Deadly pandemics have happened previously. One of the deadliest one, known as the 1918 Spanish flu, killed more than 50 million, again, I'd say it, 50 million people worldwide. And here in the United States, half a million people. And some studies even indicated in the United States, it could have been as high as 700,000 people due to lack of, lack of reporting or underreporting. So fast forward into today, we are still struggling to manage the exponentially rising transmission of the COVID-19 pandemic caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Unlike other viral diseases that tend to take a break during warm weather months, this coronavirus currently is still on the upsurge. I'm scared, I have to admit it, I'm scared, but I remain hopeful. For example, the recent news about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, known as the AZD1222, has appeared to produce promising antibody response and could move to mass scale production by the end of this year. In the absence of vaccines, however, three categories of non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs can be implemented, namely containment, suppression, and mitigation. Containment is the approach of managing individual infections, essentially isolating active cases away from the general population. 
it is deemed effective only prior to community transmission or if the cases have been suppressed down to a manageable number to effectively implement quarantine and contact tracing, just like in the case of uh, New Zealand and Taiwan and Singapore. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but they are led by female leaders. Shout out to, the, um, to those fantastic women. Suppression refers to measures in which primary aim is to reduce the reproduction number. Are not. So for those of you who are familiar with the so-called SIR model, susceptible infected uh, recovered model, so there's a parameter there called R0, which measures the transmission rate. We'd like the, this uh, multiplier effect to be less than one. So suppression measures include quarantine, travel restrictions, and also business and school closures, among others. On the other hand, mitigation is the one that is actually most closely associated with the flatten the curve concept. The primary aim is to um, implement the so-called trinity of mitigation measures. In the papers that I have published, I, ha I have coined the phrase trinity of mitigation measures that include physical distancing, face covering, and hand hyg hygiene. Some people to date still use social distancing, but I believe in my heart that it should be physical distancing because we could still be socially connected via social media, just like what we're doing today. So this slide shows the Johns Hopkins University COVID-19 dashboard. As of yesterday, so Dr. Kulaba um, requested me to submit my slide one day ahead of time. So I'm not sure to what extent the data has already changed from yesterday to today. So this slide was from yesterday, as of yesterday, there were a total of 14.5 million recorded cases and over 600,000 deaths globally. United States of America continues to lead the cases with a very big margin followed by Brazil. I hope you could see the irony here. United States is only about 4% of the world population but accounts for a staggering 25%, I repeat, 25% of the recorded cases. Makes me sad. The approach in this case study is to use epidemic curves or epic curves published by the CDC. In particular, we utilize the weekly attack rates, which tell the number of active cases expressed as a proportion of the population. Given the attack rates, we can customize the so-called sector-specific sector -specific attack rates that consider the resiliency of each sector notably its workforce. Workforce is a critical production factor. It is the heartbeat of any sector and any society. I have a published a paper with my collaborator, collaborators from De La Salle University in which we uh, came up with the acronym um, WAIT, which uh, gives the dimensions for resilience. WAIT includes workforce, the first uh, of the acronym, economy, infrastructure, geography, hierarchy, and temporal or time dimensions. Workforce debilitating events such as the COVID-19 pandemic can have adverse effects on the output, production output of any sectors. Some sectors are impacted more, some less. For example, sectors that have moved to online platforms were able to avoid significant losses. Some sectors have found creative ways to continue their operations, such as in the case of grocery and food delivery. Essential sectors such as hospitals, meat and food processing plants and stores continue to operate. Hopefully, their workforce are provided with effective PPEs or personal protective equipment. In this slide, we show the assumed parameters for the four scenarios considered in the study. Here, we could see a baseline scenario with a peak attack rate of 50% over a course of the 60-day horizon. The parameters for mitigation and suppression scenarios are also shown. Longer in duration, but significantly lower attack rates. Finally, 
The last column of this table, scenario four, is a re-simulation of the suppression scenario, taking into account sector-specific workforce resilience. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see some examples like continuity strategies, teleworking, transitioning service to online platform, curbside pickup or delivery for stores and restaurants. So this series of charts show the resulting economic losses across the four scenarios. Each chart shows the most affected sectors. Even a cursory glance at the results appears to indicate the efficacy of mitigation and suppression measures in flattening the curve. So uh, I will show you a more aggregated view uh, juxtaposing all of the four scenarios in a few slides from now. Several observations could be made. The loss incurred in each sector is a function of both the magnitude of its GDP as well as its reliance on labor. The simulation also reveals the heavily impacted sectors that are among the highest contributors to the GDP, including government, trade, and construction. The results also appear to indicate profound impacts on labor-dependent sectors, such as service, hospitals, food, and labor-dependent management companies. This chart aggregates the losses for all sectors in each of the four scenarios. It shows the extent to which mitigation and suppression measures could effectively flatten the curve. So for those who are watching the news right before we started this uh, um, virtual presentation, I would surmise that some of you saw the study for the United States that strongly said that if 90% of the population in the United States would uh, practice the trinity of mitigation, what's the trinity again? Physical distancing, hand hygiene, and the controversial mask, then the, the wave will be flattened and will actually be uh, within the control just like what's happening in Taiwan, New Zealand, as well as uh, Singapore, and also for some, to some extent, Japan. So given the simulation of the four scenarios, the cumulative economic losses were computed showing a stark contrast and potential savings realizable with the implementation of suppression and mitigation measures. The losses were also expressed as a percentage of the GDP. The data here shown on this slide is for the United States. A recent article by Correa and others looked at the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and concluded that cities that implemented stricter measure, uh, measures generally realized higher employment rates several years after the pandemic. Nonetheless, in the implementation of mitigation and suppression measures, Policymakers and government officials need to be cognizant of the negative side effects of such measures. These side effects include decreased public morale, mental health, and substance abuse. Studies have also revealed the unfortunate disparity of effects of the pandemic across different income, income groups and different socioeconomic groups. In summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the significant gaps in current disaster risk management frameworks. Challenges include political resistance to science. I'd like to repeat it, political resistance to science and mismanagement of some regions and nations, notably the logistical issues surrounding with healthcare resource optimization and case management. To conclude, let me show you this graphic. As I read off directly from the slide, I would like to encourage you to make your own personal reflections, which could, which could also be a good segue towards the Q&A portion. So this slide says, there were three different waves of illness during the 1918 pandemic, starting in March 1918, and subsiding by summer of 1919. 
The pandemic peaked in the U.S. during the second wave, again second wave, in the fall of 1918. This highly fatal second wave was responsible for most of the U.S. deaths attributed to this pandemic. Thank you so much for your attendance and attention. I hope that in this presentation, I am able to show you my systems engineering and economic perspectives on disaster risk management. Quoting the famous George Box from statistics, all models are wrong, but some are useful. One of my favorite quotes in the world. Again, that's all models are wrong, but some are useful. Huge thanks to my students, some of whom are here, and research collaborators who continue to have faith on the usability of the inoperability input-output model. I now relinquish the floor to the esteemed Dr. Alvin Colaba to moderate the Q&A portion. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Juice. Indeed, a well-deserved uh, call lectureship awardee for this year in the field of engineering. Um, your talk uh, opens up uh, many things. Now, certainly in the Philippines, we need sound and rigorous analytical tools uh, to provide disaster planning and management insights, especially for our policymakers. So to our participants uh, here in our virtual meeting in Zoom and those who are uh, logged into our YouTube uh, channel, uh, thank you for uh, raising this uh, plenary session on call lectureship award. Uh, we are going to uh, proceed with a question and answer for this special session uh, for Dr. Just, uh, you know, Santos. Um, we have uh, one question from uh, Dr. Raymond uh, Tan. Can we uh, show that question, please? Okay. Uh, from Raymond uh, Tan. Okay, uh, okay, let's take the question from Hill Mendoza. Um, for the mitigation case study, I have a two part question. Number one, it seems to me that the inoperability metric is the sole basis for analyzing impacts. No mention about economic loss, a key component of the IO model. Second, the inoperability measure is a key variable in the model. I understand it is based on some target, ideal, planned level. Why not based on actually achievable level? So it is between zero to one because it is based on the target level. How is this target level determined or estimated? Just two questions for you from Hill. So I'll answer uh, the first question first. Inoperability is indeed the key metric for um, presenting the results, but actually economic loss is there. It might have just been buried with a 40 minute presentation. When I presented the GDP results and also those uh, trajectory of economic losses, those weights for the four scenarios, the Y axis are actually in monetary values. So it's actually um, a straightforward computation. Once we are able to compute the inoperability for a particular economic sector, we simply multiply it with the ideal GDP or the production output rather for that sector, which will give the economic loss equivalent of the inoperability. So for the second question, uh, it is uh, based on target or ideal or as planned level. You are correct. And the target level is assumed to be a forecast of the previous year's GDP. So as what we have seen in the uh, coronavirus pandemic, not just in the United States, but across the globe, there has been a um, clear reduction in the GDP because of business closures and the impact of mitigation measures. So um, the ideal level is pegged from let's say uh, first quarter GDP or second quarter GDP from previous years. And I lost uh, the copy of the, uh, like uh, there was a PowerPoint slide there and I don't know if I have already optimally answered the question. So the rejoinder to the first question, I think I've already answered it. 
So the target level is estimated from previous year's GDP levels. So in, in sum, economic loss values are directly computable from the inoperability metric. Uh, thank you, uh, Juice. Uh, let me take you to this uh, to the next question from uh, Michael uh, Promentilia. Congrats, Juice. I hope the mitigation study could be extended to Philippines setting. In this regard, would multiple disasters in succession uh, succession was considered in the simulation, and which of the resilience tactics has the largest impact in the rebound effect? So before I answer the question, uh, I'm glad to uh, see uh, Dr. Permentilia in the audience. And um, for those who don't know it, one of the most famous uh, um, articles published by the Medium, it's titled, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like Hammer, something like that. I'm blanking out because I'm nervous. But uh, Dr. Permentilia was the one who uh, single-handedly translated that seminal article by Tomas Pueyo. You would see Tomas Pueyo constantly on CNN. So Dr. Permentilia translated it in Filipino uh, version. So to answer uh, Dr. Permentilia's question, when I was writing the paper, never in my uh, imagination that, uh, that the United States will have its uh, spike right now. The assumption was a 60-day epidemic curve, which was uh, the prediction if the, the mitigation measures were religiously um, implemented by, by the White House and also the population. But unfortunately, uh, I don't want to go to the politics of this, but since the people here are believers of science, so um, try to imagine the epidemic curve to have been a smooth unimodal function, but in the case of the United States, it's currently a bimodal function. So to answer Dr. Permentilia's question, in the scenario which was simplified enough, I didn't take into consideration this succession of events, and I myself was surprised with the bim bimodality. It's, it's not even the second wave yet, but you could see the bimodal nature, which if I were to resimulate the scenario, I could have a uh, considered two peak attack rates for the study. And I hope um, I'm able to answer your question, Dr. Permentilia. And of course- uh, uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, Juice. Of course, thank this uh, study, this study, just quickly, this study could be uh, implemented also in the Philippines, uh, Dr. Krista Yu and also um, the DLSU economists are uh, familiar with input-output model and also computable general equilibrium. Thank you, Juice. We haven't uh, received questions on the YouTube, uh, you know, listeners. Um, let me uh, read the question from Raymond Tan. Thanks, Juice, for your excellent talk and congrats on a well-deserved recognition. My question is whether permanent BI losses uh, such as from bankruptcies due to COVID-19 are functionally equivalent to physical damage to capital goods from disasters such as hurricanes, earthquakes, and others? That's an ex excellent question. And um, I still have to process the question outside of this presentation. But my quick answer right now is um, perhaps... Uh, permanent losses to firms and companies that cannot be uh, recovered after the pandemic could be, uh, we could do, uh, draw a parallelism uh, with capital losses or the stock losses that I mentioned in one of the slides um, in order to uh, forecast the future economic losses until such uh, equivalent building occupancy classes associated with this economic sectors could be revived in the future. So um, humbly, this is an excellent question and a tough one, and I don't have a ready-made answer right now. Thank you, Just uh, Raymond, it has to wait. Uh, maybe an opportunity for uh, further uh, uh, collaborative uh, work. Some uh, uh, just comments 
from Ed Silpena, our Vice President of Paase. Congrats, Juice, for your co-award and for a very nice talk. Also, for providing our Paase colleagues a glimpse of the importance of mathematics, linear algebra, and for quoting George Box. <laughs> okay. Um, there is a, an additional uh, uh, suggestion from Hill Mendoza, as he has earlier actually asked uh, his question. Um, the second study, uh, which focuses on economic loss, which was missing in the first case study. Um, I'm wondering and recommend that in both case studies, both economic loss and inoperability metric uh, should be used. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, you know, a comment. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, anyway, he sends his uh, congratulations uh, to you, Juice, from Hill Mendoza. Um, we still have a couple of uh, minutes, about three to five minutes, uh, to accommodate more questions. If there are questions from the YouTube uh, listeners, you know, uh, from our audience here in Zoom, you are most welcome, you know, to uh, speak now. Okay. So uh, it seems that uh, everyone's, uh, you know, satisfied, uh, their appetite's, uh, you know, is full, uh, just uh, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, it is uh, worth, uh, you know, more than just a thousand US dollars, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations again. And let's give uh, Dr. Juice Santos, our 2020 co-lectureship awardee in engineering, a virtual round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you, Just uh, Of course, I know you will be holding on uh, in this session as we proceed uh, with uh, our uh, uh, two additional talks from, uh, you know, our distinguished uh, speakers, which I will be introducing in a minute. 